make sure that each one of you finds something completely incomprehensible in what I'm about to present. <laughs> but you know, another uh, has to do with kind of fixing the planet. And all those people in here who don't have gray hair like I do are the ones who are going to vote uh, and make a difference in the future. And I hope that what I show you, my third goal, is that things aren't exactly hopeless, but we're going to have to be very smart about it and know what in the world we're doing as we proceed. And of course, this is about energy, and energy, of course, is maybe the single most important commodity on the planet right now. And what I want to do is convince you of uh, roots to making sure that we can use uh, energy that does not damage the planet, that is renewable energy. And I'm going to show you what the problems are and what is not a problem today. And I need to get this little thing over here that's not to advance the slides. I mean, uh... All right, let's see if uh, Apple is better than Microsoft. Ah, excellent. So I want to, I'm going to talk about technology today. And I want to start out, and I want you to remember this slide throughout the entire talk, that our, the accuracy our, of our ability to predict technology is just a joke. And, and I got a few like one-liners here. So here's Warner Brothers in 1927. Got it? And then Daryl Zanuck, 20th Century Fox. Television won't be able to hold on to any market. People will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box. <laughs> There's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. It's Ken Olson, founder of uh, digital equipment, which hasn't done, that, done too well. And uh, Wilbur Wright, who very thoughtfully said to his brother uh, that uh, man would not fly for 15 years, and then he, for 50 years, and he says after that, ever since I have distrusted myself and avoided all predictions. <laughs> and my favorite, there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. No chance. <laughs> and that, of course, is from Microsoft. OK, so keep this in mind, because I'm going to be predicting technology. <laughs> so uh, let, me, let me just start off with another question I want you to keep thinking about. And that is, why are we not extinct? I mean, this is, you know, we, this, this country, set this thing off on the ground in the water. Fantastic, huh? And there's Pacific Ocean. So, one of the reasons, uh, and of course, there's my favorite character of all time. All high school kids have no idea who that is, but, but we all know. Uh, but look, you know, all of the very finest technology has come from um, uh, the development of weapons. And you can, you can put that over the last 4,000 years of works. <clears throat> but today, in fact, the, the science that went into developing these awful weapons at Los Alamos uh, now leaves on the ground up there an absolutely superb national lab. And that national lab has expertise that is second to none in specific areas having to do with renewable energy, and we're bringing that to bear today. Let me keep going on the why are we not extinct, and just remind you of that things are not always what they seem. Uh, this is Three Mile Island uh, during the big mess that it made uh, back in the 80s. And the amount of radiation it leaked, it leaked into the atmosphere from its core melting down uh, which was, of course, a, uh, prohibited by the regulations uh, that govern a nuclear power plant. The amount of radiation it released is about the same as the San Juan generating station throws up the stacks from the radioactive contaminants in coal. So just keep that in mind that these guys are allowed to dump radiation into the air without regulation and about the same quantities that these guys did, but were illegal. OK, so let's start in a little bit on renewable energy. Uh, and I want to uh, lay the groundwork for why we have problems about these sorts of things. 
Here's a couple of quotes. Some cities are cutting back on public transport, transit at a time when their citizens need it the most. This is cost-driven cutbacks where we would have saved huge amounts of fossil fuels. And here's a really critical one. Regional electric lines have been so congested that Maple Ridge Wind Farm has been forced to shut down in brisk winds. I'm going to show you why that is and how we're going to stop it and make sure we use it. And then there are other things, and I hope I offend somebody in the audience with this quote, but look, you know, this, this verbiage here, let me just read it to you. Styling like a badge of honor, the signature crosshair grill, powerful stance and chiseled lines come together like a shot of adrenaline <coughs> to the arm of an anemic crowd of cut and dried sport utility vehicles. It's time to get noticed. Well, that attitude is not the one that's going to get us to 2050 and still be able to breathe the air. So, in fact, a lot of the drivers for the energy crisis are, are thought free. Okay, uh, let's, let's now get to some basics on renewable energy. This, this color map, and I know you probably can't read the axes, but I'm going to walk you through every last bit of this. This is wind energy available in New Mexico, perfectly clean. And, and up here, this is, this is January through December on this axis, and this is midnight to midnight on this axis. So you can see right here, this big red blob around March, April, May, and late into the evening, 10 o'clock at night, or we have huge wind energy coming into this state. Fabulous amounts, and I'm going to give you some numbers to take home with. So, uh, this is pretty nice, but the problem is that this is the load map, this is the electrical energy the public service company in New Mexico has to supply. Again, this January to December, midnight to midnight, that's 4 o'clock in the afternoon in August. And what do you think is going on there? Those are all the air conditioners in Albuquerque. So we got to get this red blob and this red blob to match up. And you know, if, if you figure out how to do it, it's pretty much game over. We've saved the planet. So, we know how to make electricity today from sunlight. Lots of technology out there. Photovoltaics are okay, but mirrors, boiling steam, and turning steam turbines are absolutely superb. Those, by the way, are twice as efficient and half as expensive as photovoltaics for generating electricity. Uh, we know how to make electricity from wind. We'll improve these things over the next 20 or 30 years, but wind turbines are really darn good today, and they're getting better. So most of these technology problems are solved. But it's going to be a long time before we develop the technology to store enough of this energy in March and carry it over to August that we can even use 25% of our utility grid, of our energy consumption, um, coming from renewable energy sources. So that's the big science problem. Most of the others are simply just build it and they will come. But the energy storage issue is really critical. So let's keep looking at, at why these, uh, I'll kind of dive deeper and deeper into why these are, are complicated uh, problems. So A, the energy doesn't come when we need it. B, the loads that the electrical utilities see are unpredictable. unpredictable. Now you might look at this and say, oh, well look, there's the, the summer usage by XL Energy in Colorado for three weeks. Oh, it looks really periodic. I, I can just predict exactly what's going to happen. But the answer is you can't, because the difference between this peak and this peak is the entire output of San Juan Generating Station. So they can't predict the height of those peaks to the output of four coal-fired uh, steam turbines. So the loads indeed are unpredictable. And we're trying to meet this demand in renewables with technologies that don't behave the, w behave the way we'd like them to. C, the utility grid is inflexible. <coughs> Typically, you'll have uh, the electrical generation in any large chunk of utility grid in this country has a fixed base load. Uh, this could be coal and nuclear, and 50% or more 
of the electrical energy is generated there. And it, you can't change this. In fact, if you go to San Juan Generating Station and you go up to one of the control rooms for these, the, these big uh, coal-fired steam turbines, you know, they got a carburetor outside this control room that's two stories high, and they're blowing coal dust through this into six-foot diameter burners to burn the coal to make steam. And when and the guy operating the plant, the main operator, is looking at a counter on the wall, and he's looking to see if the number of cycles of 60 cycle AC is getting a little bit ahead or behind what the atomic clocks say it should be. And when the the turbines have been running a little fast. He's got a two foot long throttle and he pulls this thing back. And the plant starts to slow down and half an hour later the turbines are running a little bit slower. So you can't do much with this, this load in here. To make up for it, we've got medium and fast and these things are basically jet engines hooked up to an electrical generator. You know, these are combined cycle gas turbines. Uh, I'll show you some more about that in a minute. Now, would you explain what is that for us? I'm, I'm, hang on. Okay. We'll, we'll get to it. So, if we're looking here, you can see that I've, I've laid out things that don't, don't change the rate at which they generate electricity hardly at all, things that have a medium response speed, things that have a, a high response speed. And at any particular time, um, during a year or so, maybe a very small fraction of the time you've got all three of these running, and a small fraction of the time you have just this running, but most of the most of the time you have all of these sources going. So here's what happens. We add a wind farm to this, this picture. The wind farm is generating that much energy. No sweat. Wind comes up, it produces this much energy. I just take down all my fast and slow down my medium speed electrical generating capabilities. My, my fossil fuel stuff goes down to here. Wind takes care of that, I'm in great shape. But let's say that I'm over here, same thing happens. Well, when that energy comes up in the wind farm, I can't shut this load off, so I've got to stop it right at this point because there's this pesky physical law called conservation of energy and I've got to do it, something with it. The only thing I can do is shut the wind farm down. So there it is, because I can't find a place to store that energy, I've had to shut down a 206 megawatt wind farm in New Mexico and stop generating renewable energy. Uh, this is pretty stressful on utilities. This is, this is the top secret big board. Uh, I won't tell you exactly where it is because PNM said I can't, but uh, they let me take a picture of it. And this is what they're watching all the time. So here's the a, here's a four San Juan generating station, coal fired turbines. You know, at 164, 216 megawatts, 232 megawatts. This one's down for the moment. These are the Reeves uh, uh, gas, gas turbines. There's another one in Luna. So they're watching all the outputs of these things. And you can see these medium response speed generators are offline right now. And uh, a couple of the, of the gas turbines are, are running. But here's the interesting one. Here's the wind energy, 27.9 megawatts. That's a fair chunk of energy coming from that wind farm. And while I was watching this thing, that wind farm went from 27.9 to about 50 megawatts in the course of a minute because the wind came up. So they got a backpedal like crazy. And in fact, uh, that also happens with photovoltaic energy sources into our utility grid in New Mexico. That when they come up, PNM has to throttle back gas turbines and coal-fired power plants. And those things don't run efficiently apart throttle. They run very, they produce the least amount of CO2 when running wide open per kilowatt hour burn. So when the photovoltaics come up and uh, uh, in the middle of the afternoon uh, in Albuquerque, they're shutting down stuff quickly when they really don't want to. But in the summer, every afternoon, every afternoon pretty much, PNM combined cycle gas turbines, and, and you can ask me what a combined cycle gas turbine is later. I'll answer that question. Uh, they have to take about an hour to ramp up. They run for a few hours and then they shut them down to meet the peak cooling demand that we can't meet with our base load. So it's pretty awful. Happens every day. 
Okay, so everything I've set up till now can be encompassed in this one picture. You guys get it? There it is, the United States at night. Try to light that up with photovoltaics. Right? Think a minute, right? <laughs> photovoltaics only make electricity when the sun's shining. Hard to light it up at night. Okay, and the other piece has to do with this. Uh, you know, you've all seen this joke, but in fact, there is a, a very clear, subtle thing hiding behind here, and I'll say it now and I'll hit it again, and that is that one of the solutions to the energy storage problem, and it's, you'll see that I'm biased and it's going to be my favorite as we proceed through this, are liquid fuels. That is, I'd like to be, us to be able to make liquid chemicals that we can later recover either as a, through electricity or as a <coughs> transportation fuel because you'll never drive a semi from Chicago to Los Angeles loaded with freight running it on batteries. Not going to happen. So batteries may be fine for local transportation in cities, but they will not run a semi. They won't fly an airplane. So we're stuck with liquid fuels as an important part of the energy economy. Uh, New Mexico is a really special place. It's a canary in a coal mine for energy storage, and here's why. Um, if renewables, renewable energy sources, are going to destabilize any utility grid, it's going to be ours. New Mexico has the highest fraction of renewable energy of any state, and there are moments late at night, in the spring, when 25% of our electrical power comes from wind. Population is small. Uh, and we have a fair amount of wind energy, 204 megawatts that PNM can deliver to New Mexico citizens. There's a lot more, but it's dedicated to selling out of state in New Mexico. And there are bizarre legislative things going on that require that PNM provide transmission line capacity for every watt that that wind farm can produce, even though it's only maybe one hour out of the year that it's producing full output. So there are legislative things that are making renewable energy unnecessarily expensive. Looks like $100 million to get electricity from here to there. This is kind of a map of all the major power transmission routes in New Mexico. And PNM must, by contract, take all the wind energy produced by this wind farm. They have to do it. So they can't shut the, farm, the wind farm down, or they lose money, and they have to pay the contractor. Uh, it gets worse and worse. By the way, just keep in mind that one megawatt hour is about $100, and it's two months of electricity for a typical home. All right, so where are we going to put this energy? There's, uh, there's only two places in, in physics that you can store energy, uh, and they are potential energy and kinetic energy. So potential energy has to be stored in a field. And a field is uh, a very specific buzzword in physics. And there are only a very, very few of them. One of them is gravitational, another is chromodynamic, and another is electroweak. You like those words? Is that good? <laughs> OK. So, so you recognize one of them, right? You got gravity. That was good. But it turns out that chromodynamic embedded in that at certain energy scales are the forces that hold nuclei together and make chemistry possible. And electroweak, again, at energy levels where humans are actually able to exist, turns into electric and magnetic fields and related things. So uh, those fields are one thing we have to work with. And the other is kinetic energy. So he here it is. Here's the roller coaster. You know, the roller coaster, once it starts, there's no motors driving it after comes down the first hill. It essentially coasts over all the bumps until it comes to a stop. Yeah. At the top, it's got all the energy it's going to need by lifting that thing up in a gravitational field. Then, when it falls down the first hill, most of that energy is converted from potential energy, the energy stored in the gravitational field, to kinetic energy, the energy of motion. And that's it. So those are, those are the two fundamental Roots to storing energy. And technology in use today includes things like pump hydroelectric. I'm going to give you examples of a lot of these in just a second. Flywheels, compressed air, various batteries, and this means potential energy, kinetic energy. Magnetic fields, electricity that fuels, my favorite, capacitors, thermal. And it turns out that only 
electricity to fuels and capacitors um, are really identified as needing fundamental research today, although batteries are starting to show a little bit. Um, I should stop a minute and take a question or two. Okay, the quiz, the quiz afterwards. I'll remember you didn't ask any questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is all I know about batteries. Uh, we'll, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, so let's start with kinetic energy here. Flywheels and compressed air store store in kinetic energy, but so does quantum confinement. There, how's that for another good buzzword? Uh, so kinetic energy, you guys understand that. Here's a, a graphite flywheel built by uh, Beacon Power in New York State. Uh, this thing runs at, uh, well, the rim runs at rifle bullet speeds. Okay? And it's, some of it's held up on superconducting bearings or sometimes um, gas bearings. Um, it has about the same energy density when it's spun up as a really good lithium ion battery. It's very fast to get energy in and out. It's very nice and, re and reversible. So you use a generator um, to extract the energy and a motor to spin it up. And those can be done very, very efficiently. So this is a sort of a 90% efficient solution to energy storage, but it's got a few problems. One of the problems is that after a while, these things stop spinning, no matter what you did, how well you built them, how good the bearings are. They can't hold energy forever. Uh, what do you think happens if you get a nick in that thing while it's moving it? <laughs> That's not what happens. <laughs> so it's, it's graphite epoxy composite, and as soon as it goes out of balance, it's sitting in a vacuum chamber, right? You can't run these things in air. So it's sitting in a vacuum chamber, goes out of balance, instantly turns to graphite powder, and all the powder falls to the bottom of the vacuum chamber. But that's not what you thought was going to happen. Uh, compressed air uh, is an energy storage mechanism, and New Mexico is probably going to have one of these uh, compressed air energy storage systems, but it requires a big cavity underground. You don't dig that, you have to find it. Uh, and there aren't that many of them. And I'm always stunned that you can put a thousand PSI in a cavity underground and it doesn't just go, but they do it. And there's some subtleties here I'm not going to go into. Them. And finally, uh, you know, if you've got electrons whizzing around in a metal and you do something to them with chemistry to localize the region in which they exist, you know, it's like taking a ping pong ball between two ping pong paddles, you know, it goes like this and you bring them together and it goes well, that's the same thing that happens with electrons as you compress them, kinetic energy is forced to go up. It's a quantum mechanical effect. It's an important part of energy storage in batteries and capacitors. Nuclear forces, well, we can get energy out really fast, but uh, it's pretty hard to stuff it back in the bottle, so we'll, we'll, we'll leave that. Magnetic fields, now you might think this would work, but it turns out that magnetic fields at the level at which energy storage makes some sense, and this is again lithium ion battery storage levels, produce, require containers like this at the National High Magnetic Field Lab that can hold 450,000 pounds per square inch. So that's pretty rough. We'll leave that one out too. Gravitational field, that's a good tested method of energy storage. You pump water uphill with electric motors, or recover energy with water-driven generators as it comes back downhill. Really hard to put that in Sierra County, New Mexico. <laughs> so you kind of need the geological structure to be there before you can use this mechanism. And we need mechanisms that we can put anywhere. So you know, my favorite is chemistry. I'm a physicist, and I'm going <laughs> to remind you now that I will not take any questions from chemists at the end of this, this talk. Uh, but chemistry is, uh, is pretty, pretty interesting for energy storage. And I'm going to hit this now pretty hard in the next few slides. Now here's a lightning strike in, uh, in Truth or Consequences in New Mexico. When I took the picture, there were 50 mile an hour winds blowing the plasma uh, column sideways, so you can see as the lightning goes back and forth several times in a fraction of a second, the lightning strikes moving sideways and the whole thing's being preserved. But the electric fields that 
I want to use to store energy. Well, this lightning strike is a thousandth of a volt per nanometer. That's not very much in, in terms of chemistry because when I connect hydrogen and, and carbon, I've got electric fields of 10 volts per nanometer, which is 10 billion volts across one meter. So these electric fields aren't even in the ballpark for storing energy, not even close. We need the electric fields and chemical bonds to store energy in really large quantities. So the uh, trouble is that uh, a lot of innovative work has been done on conversion of bond energy to electricity. That's fuel cells and batteries. But the reverse cycle, that is electrolysis, the production of the chemicals that we would use to re recover electricity, has not received as much attention. And there's several ways to make electricity into liquid fuels. Uh, one of them, my absolute favorite, is, is ammonia. And I urge you to keep in mind these words when you're asked to vote for politicians who don't want to make ammonia as the nation's energy storage material. OK, I've got my plug in. But look, think about ammonia. So uh, it's better than hydrogen. You know, hydrogen's a gas. You could make hydrogen store energy. George Bush really liked that. And, uh, that was his problem. But think about hydrogen because this gas, to get any decent amount into a car, you've got to put, a, put it in about 10 or 15,000 pounds per square inch in a tank under your butt going down US 285, made by the lowest bidder for the automotive industry. <laughs> OK. But ammonia, you can put in a propane bottle. That is a steel, a welded steel tank. That's about the cheapest energy storage device you can possibly come up with. Um, and ammonia, ammonia, uh, no, this is not the stuff you clean the kitchen with. This is NH3, so it's, it's a gas at room temperature, but a little bit of pressure uh, makes it liquid. You can burn it in a diesel engine, and farmers used to do that at the uh, beginning of the last century, or mid part of the last century, because you can also stuff it in the ground to grow crops. It's the most important industrial fertilizer on the planet. And furthermore, it's got a lot of hydrogen in it. So you can run it in a fuel cell and convert it directly to electricity. So you've got stuff you can burn it and make energy. You can put it in the ground and grow crop crops if you have too much of it. And you can run it through a very clean fuel cell and make electricity out of it. So that's the one I am actually actively engaged in researching at Los Alamos National Lab. There are other, other things you can do. You can make methanol. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I just want to mention the toxicity issue for just a second. You know, let's say that uh, you're this brilliant inventor, and you've, you've, you've been living in Oklahoma, and this black stuff starts coming out of the ground. And you mess with it in your garage a little while, and you distill this this liquid, and this liquid is, is flammable, carcinogenic, and toxic. But you discover if you put it in a piston engine, it can make a car go off. So you go to the EPA and say, I want to license this new chemical mishmash I just discovered for use as a vehicle fuel. The EPA would laugh you out of Washington. They wouldn't even let you start. The only reason you can use gasoline today is it's grandfathered in. So don't complain to me about the toxicity of other energy storage chemicals because none of them are as bad as gasoline. OK, so uh, I like ammonia. I like fuel cells to get the energy that we put into put in to get ammonia. I like fuel cells to get that energy back out. And now, by the way, has one of the finest fuel cell research programs on the planet. Just remember that. Uh, and here's, here's some numbers for you, just so you get perspective. Liquid fuels, gasoline, ammonia, methanol, methane, whatever you like. It's about a, a dollar or so worth of energy per kilogram of material. The very best lit lithium ion batteries store about a penny worth of energy per kilogram. That's what you're up against in transportation. It's 100 to 1 energy density. Floating around. And this is the world record holder, just in case you were wondering. Uh, that's something we can aspire to. Uh, if you want to measure the 
efficiency of energy storage, uh, one of the very good ways to noodle out what's going on is energy return on energy invested. That is, how much energy did it take for me to dig that oil well, pump oil out of the ground, distill it, and make a useful fuel? Uh, it's some amount of energy, and that energy has some cost. So in the 1930s, oil was easy to get out of the ground, <coughs> coal was easy to mine. It was 100 units of energy for every one I expended. In the 70s, it dropped to 30 to 1, and we're heading to 5 to 1 as we start to use up the easily mined fossil fuels and head towards pulling oil and natural gas out of shale and rock where it's not normally, uh, normally e or easily available. So today, engineers and scientists will together control this number along with a few pesky physical laws that we're not going to be able to get, get away from. And today's fossil fuels are all, already worse than 20 to 1 and heading downhill. So even though we, have, we, we are addicted to liquid fossil fuels, it's possible to make some of these fuels from wind and solar if we get the chemistry right. Uh, let me just go through a little bit the science problems here for a minute before I, I finish up. So making chemicals from electricity is in fact a science problem. It's not a technology problem. That is, we don't know how to do this yet, but there's a few really important things about the, the physics and chemistry problem, one of which is there's no physical law that says we can't do what I'm about to uh, show you. Uh, we can't do it yet. We haven't figured out how to do it, but we're not going to break any laws. So I'm going to just look at hydrogen because it's a simple thing to look at, and I'm going to look at uh, the efficiency of taking electricity into hydrogen and then recovering electricity from the hydrogen using the best technology today. It turns out that every electron I put in is one I get out when I make this process. So I don't have to measure anything but the electrical voltages required for each of these processes. So it's really simple to understand. So I start with a voltage in. And if it's about... A, about one and a half volts of electricity in, and it's about one and a quarter volts if I were to electrolyze steam. I take water to hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen I throw away, I don't need it, because there's plenty in the atmosphere, but the hydrogen I heat. Then I run the hydrogen through a fuel cell, which produces 0.7 volts of electricity out, and water. So I put in, say, one and a quarter volts, I got out 0.7 volts. The round trip efficiency here is about 50%. That's fantastic, by the way. If we could do that with ammonia, we're done. We don't have to do anything else. We can shut down all the nuclear plants, shut down the coal plants, just build wind and solar, and we can, um, we'll be fine. And this difference is the efficiency uh, killer. We want this to be as small as possible, and it's called the overpotential. The goal of science is to reduce this, and these are just some of the sources of it. I'm not going to mention too much about that. And to do this, you don't actually have to do chemistry these days. The ability to, do, uh, to, to compute, to make models of the chemistry, is getting so good that we can do a lot of the exploration in big computers. And some of these computers are run mostly with uh, PlayStation 2 microprocessors in it. <laughs> yeah, but it's thousands of them, <laughs> all in one place. And they're faster than most things. You know, I, I guarantee you, we have no idea what high-performance computing is going to look like in five years. Oops. Oh, well, I wasn't going to show this, but I guess I'm going to, now that it's up. Um, so this is the kind of stuff uh, I'm not going to explain one single thing on this slide, but uh, what's up here is a math problem, and it's a math problem relating to chemistry, and the problem is so simple that it doesn't explain, well, a single thing we need to know to store energy, but it's the state of the art, roughly, in chemistry and understanding these processes today, and one of our jobs is to make this so much more like real life and so much more complicated that we can use it to predict what's going to happen. Uh, so, uh, 
Here is my favorite uh, energy storage device, a big, big welded steel tank. You can't beat it at cost. Uh, you take the electrical generator. By the way, this is the electrical generator in my lab at the Magnet Lab. And, and there's Vivian Zapp standing, standing up so you get an idea of the scale of this thing. I want to stuff that into some box and make ammonia come out, put it in this big tank, leave it there until summer, and then run it through a fuel cell and out comes electricity. And I want to do this at something like 30 to 50 percent round trip efficiency. And you don't, you don't have to be perfect because even if the efficiency is only 50 percent, that's better than shutting down your wind farm. You've already built it and the thing's running, so you might as well have some place to put that energy. So in the end, uh, I think we and you and all of us have not succeeded in answering all of our questions. Indeed, we sometimes feel that we have not completely answered any of them. The answers we found only serve to raise a whole new set of questions. In some ways, we feel that we are as confused as ever. But we think we are now confused on a higher level and about more important things. And that author is unknown. And I've got two quotes from my kids. I've got to throw those in. This is my son, age three, told me to <coughs> beware of the muddle puddles. It's good advice to us all. And one of my favorites of all time was my other son, Robbie, age 10, uh, showed me this. I said, what is it you said? I was trying to paint a jungle scene, but it came out looking like a clown suit. <laughs> Thank you. Second slide, Jerry. It was our ability to predict technology. No, now I'll answer your question. Look, uh, I would say hundred billion dollars. Billion? Yeah. If we put, if we do a real Manhattan project on this problem, we will solve it. Uh, I don't think it's going to be solved for ten billion. But how much? How much did the uh, housing values drop in the in the Southwest over the last few years? It's probably less than it would cost to solve this entire energy problem. And probably wouldn't have dropped. So how much are they spending on R and D at like these, you know, Exxon and Mobile? Well, uh, Chevron puts uh, puts a good you know, several hundred million dollars a year in R and D that relates to renewable energy. Exxon Mobil's com comparable. Uh, the National Science Foundation's entire budget is a billion dollars or so, and it doesn't really. Uh, I mean, there's some focus on this, but not a lot. The, Department of Energy puts a lot of its money into things that have to do with nuclear energy and nuclear weapons and less, but not zero, into these, these sorts of things. How do you fix that? You remember when you're voting that you're going to have a say in, in where your money goes. So if this is possible, you have to support the science. I don't care if we do it or Germany does it or Japan does it, but we really got to do this before things um, get worse. Why haven't I never heard about ammonia before? This is the first time. Why have you go? What? Excellent. <laughs> Good. I mean, I read popular mechanics. I read popular science. I have read nothing about this before. Why is it out there? I agree. So. Uh, We, we have um, uh, somewhat of a disconnect between cutting-edge research in these areas right now, once it's in popular literature. Uh, hydrogen's, hydrogen as a storage mechanism has a bad name among scientists. So we're looking for places to put this. I will tell you, though, that there are major conferences in the U.S and internationally on ammonia as an energy storage mechanism today. And this has been understood as one of the main routes for several years now. It is an extremely difficult chemistry problem. I'll also tell you that the second most produced industrial chemi chemical in the world is ammonia. 
So the storage and distribution networks are already in place. And I can't answer why you didn't hear about it. Okay, you next. Um, it's, it seems to me that uh, what's not addressed here is that we're always talking about putting the energy into a grid. It so happens that 75% of the energy that's produced at San Juan is actually lost in transmission. So wouldn't it be the That's not true. Energy? That's not even close. But never the, it's less. But nevertheless, it's a very substantial amount. Yeah. yeah. So, what I'm, so what I'm suggesting is that rather than look at a model where P and M uh, is, is plugged into a bigger grid, why not have local and community-based energy systems? You know, we need about another 1.9 million of you in New Mexico. <laughs> so look, this is exactly on target. There, what if you built the magic ammonia machine? You know, how big is it going to have to be? Well, you know, things are, things have to be big enough to be efficient. Small electric motors are really inefficient. But as soon as they get into the 5 or 10 horsepower range, they're starting to run at 95% efficiency. So you could imagine building some sort of ammonia storage device that could cover, say, well, it might not be one house, but it might be a block or a neighborhood. In which case, you've just, uh, you've just spread this all over as a delocalized source. You don't have to big, build big utility grids to, to shuffle the energy around. And in fact, the distributed energy storage uh, strategy stabilizes the utility grid against faults. Uh, there are so many reasons to do this if it could be done. And a lot of small ones is more reliable than one big one. It allows for competition among man manufacturers. There's a lot of good reasons for it. I'm with you on that. Okay. Uh, more of a quick question. Uh, so the, uh, the ratios that you put up on the board, uh, 1930, we were producing one. Yeah. So uh, I am surmising from that figure that <coughs> Peak oil is somewhere in the 70s. Actually, peak oil is a moving target. It, once, you, once you start to fracture underground rock structures, the, the amount of oil goes way up. So we have not reached either peak oil or peak gas based on modern fracking technology, for example. So don't get me started. We got one more back there. And we got, got you guys. Yeah. Uh, in the State of the Union address, the President had said that uh, a, a bright spot for technology and um, the future is storage technology for renewable energy, and somehow we were going to be able to export this technology. Is, was he talking about ammonia? Uh, he, ammonia? he is not talking specifically about ammonia, but ammonia is very definitely in the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation's strategy for energy storage. So at the technical level, that is an intrinsic part of that message. And yes, indeed, that without him being specifically detailed, yes, he was talking about ammonia, methanol, methane, other energy, energy storage chemicals, and batteries, and flywheels, and hydroelectric. So I think you will see every single viable energy storage technology used, but my favorite and the one I'm working on and the one I think is the most difficult science challenge is electricity to liquid fuels. Bill. If I understood you, it seems that... You understood me? At all? <laughs> if, if, <laughs> if you are to allow the turbines to spin at whatever rate they want to spin at, and your output is variable, Without shutting them down, you need loads to consume that energy at the other end somewhere. Or energy source. Yeah. But because it varies so quickly, potentially varies quickly, do you not, are you not then forced back to smaller individual devices that can be switched in and off quickly? Whereas, oh. the, just like the generator problem, if it can't spin up quickly enough to respond to changing, don't you have to have millions of little ammonia generators that can be turned on and off quickly? No. Uh, so let me tell you, That's not a problem. let me answer that though in, in a little bit more detail. What I'd like to see is the 
coal-fired power plants to be smaller and run at full throttle all the time. The maximum thermodynamic efficiency, but a smaller plant. You never slow them down. They just run 24 hours a day full output. The way you regulate the load is the energy storage mechanism. How fast can you charge a battery? How can, uh, no, more precisely, how fast can you start charging a battery? Time it takes to flip a switch. So the response times for starting ammonia generation from an electrochemical process, we're not talking about a chemical or a thermal process, but electric, electrochemical is pretty much instantaneous. And same, same for extracting energy. So it doesn't have to spin up. It doesn't have to spin up. Uh, let's see, I missed one. Uh, yeah. I read conflicting accounts of the ITER uh, and don't know uh, where it's going. And they never address the energy storage problems and transmission. Could you tell people what that's about uh, and, 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 and inform me a little bit about where it might go? Well, he's, he's talking about thermonuclear uh, uh, energy. So the, the, the joke among scientists is that uh, the production of uh, electrical energy from thermonuclear processes, which are might sound pretty clean, but when you get into the details, you might not like it so much. But anyway, the joke is that it's always 20 years in the future, no matter when you ask. <laughs> Second, the, the, the attempt to make these things break even, that is gain one, is the, is the phrase. What that means is the electrical energy put into the thermonuclear burn plant, be it the national ignition <coughs> facility, um, in Livermore or, uh, or, the, or the magnetic compressions in Europe, the energy put in is equal to the energy out. Once you reach that, you're in good shape. Uh, they don't even think about what to do with the energy out. That, that's somebody else's problem. So those are completely unrelated at this point. Uh, Bob. My, that's my goal. It won't happen in my lifetime, but yeah, that's, a, that's exactly the point. If you have reasonably efficient, now when I say grid scale, I mean, I don't care if it's distributed or centralized right now. I just want enough to store, say, the entire output of Four Corners, you know, San Juan generating station and Four Corners coal-fired power plants. I want to store like a week's worth of their electricity somewhere on the utility grid. Once you do that, you don't need coal and nuclear. Just, just start building windmills and, and uh, solar thermal, thermal electricity power plants. Not, it's not outrageous. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you for coming tonight.